This is one topic that is certainly discussed and it's on the wheel of, of ERAS elements, but almost all of the evidence came before implementation of our enhanced recovery protocol um, data. So it's interesting to look at this as one of the many examples of the data that has been accrued and looked at and reviewed to help develop enhanced recovery rather than really looking at it within a protocol already. These are individual elements where there was evidence available that we weren't using until we looked at enhanced recovery and tried to make other changes. Basically, this is the only slide you need to see. You need to use less of all of these tubes, so less use of fewer tubes, and we'll go through each of these. How I've designed this talk is to talk about the things that we kind of believe about the, these tubes and drains and lines, particularly from a surgeon's perspective, compared to when they're actually indicated. Um, NG tubes, I grew up through residency, believing that we needed to decompress the stomach until there was bowel function. This is actually backwards. Um, if you continue to empty out the stomach, you help to shut down the GI tract and you're just going to wait that much longer. Um, there was also a belief that if you swallow too much air, you actually will create an ileus or challenge your anastomosis. I'll leave it to the upper GI surgeons to debate whether or not any decompression is necessary for the first 24 hours after a gastric anastomosis, but for colorectal, there's no indication. Um, if you need to use it for anything relative to gastric, it's not because you're talking about enhanced recovery or colorectal resection. So specifically, we don't need NG tubes. When they've been studied, we have seen that patients have an incidence that's lower in fever, general as it is, atelectasis and pneumonia. We also see a decreased incidence of ileus when you omit an NG tube from routine colorectal care postoperatively. We see, of course, decreased complaints. Patients hate NG tubes. And we did see a decrease in meta-analysis of respiratory complications, specifically pneumonias. And patients do not necessarily vomit more, but we do see that if they're going to vomit, it may be more without the, the gastric decompression. So the only benefit you're getting is you're emptying the stomach instead of having the patient do it. Absolutely no increase in M morbidity or mortality, such as anastomotic leak with the use of NG tubes. Therefore, they're not indicated in routine colorectal surgery. Intra-abdominal drains, I'll be very specific here. I'm not talking about pelvic drains. We used to believe that they would keep the anastomotic site clean. We know that colorectal surgery is dirty. Therefore, if we put something there, maybe it'll suck up all of the bad bugs that we dropped during the operation. Um, this hasn't proven to help us at all. It also does not protect the anastomosis by removing nearby fluid. Most of the time, the drains aren't even where we see a problem when we image people now that we have routine use of CT scan for evaluation of anastomotic complications. There was also a belief that we might find out about that anastomotic complication sooner if we had a drain sitting there, meaning we'll see the succus come out of the drain. Again, in um, prospective in many randomized trials, we've looked at the use of abdominal drains to help us evaluate if you have a high output anastomotic complication, say after a pancreatic resection, you may be able to evaluate that fluid and perhaps that's where most of our beliefs came from. For colorectal, typically what we see is that the patient walls off around the drain just as much as they wall off around a leak and you're not going to see the outcome from the drain predict any trouble with your anastomosis any sooner than you would see a clinical problem from that anastomotic leak. So the indications for placing a drain in the abdomen are not clear. The data is equivocal for pelvic operations, saying that there may be some indication for getting out the, the fluid, particularly from the operation, that may be gravity set when the patient is up walking around after a, um, a low resection or even an APR. But for abdominal drains, there's been no benefit seen. Here's the um, evidence for this, and again, at the end, I have a full list of, of all the references that I used to create this. Specifically, the Cochrane interview showed that there's no difference. In general outcomes, many surgical outcomes looked at, but specifically looking at anastomotic leak, which is what we think we're protecting or finding earlier because we have drains in place. Pelvic drains, we also saw no difference in leak or outcomes by meta-analysis.
Urinary catheters, I already mentioned that we like to follow our fluid outcome. Um, as soon as we lose all the help of anesthesia from the operating theater, we've got surgical in interns out on the ward trying to figure out what to do with these patients. They always like the magic number of some urine output. Um, we thought that we had to volume monitor, therefore we keep a catheter in. Why we thought we couldn't measure what came out of the patient, I'm not sure, but that's a fine way to do it. We also uh, know that we do need to do some decompression after uh, urologic operations, but besides that, we really don't have to have drainage in the bladder unless the patient is unable uh, to uh, empty the bladder on his own, and the indications for that are as above. Um, typically, we'll use a catheter for the first 12 to 24 hours. That gets shorter every time we revise our enhanced recovery protocol. Um, if we have an epidural in place, and again, we do use thoracic epidurals, not lumbar, we have a very low reinsertion rate or urinary retention rate with this protocol that we use. And we do use some uh, drainage of the bladder for the first three days, usually after our rectal resections. Uh, risk for urinary tension is increased in all the groups that are listed here. Pretty straightforward and old data. Um, there's a question as to whether obesity contributes to this, but it's hard to find obesity separate from any of these categories, at least in the U.S. For us, we um, either remove the catheter in the operating room on colon resections or we'll leave it until the morning of postoperative day one, which is typically between 12 and to 15 hours after the end of the case for um, if we have an epidural in place for our colon resections. Again, I don't have a lot of evidence to, to support the use of our catheters in, in the pelvis except anecdotal. Our practice is somewhere our longest catheters stay around four to five days. Right now our protocol is that we take them out on midnight on the second day after surgery, expecting the patient to fill the bladder by morning for normal voiding. Our reinsertion rate with that particular protocol with epidurals in place for all of our rectal resections, um, we have a reinsertion rate that's less than 12%. Um, which type of catheter should you use? I only ever get to say this when I speak in Europe. We don't use suprapubic catheters routinely for colorectal resections in the U.S., um, but there is a reported lower incidence of UTI. If you expect to use a urinary catheter for over four to five days, you should consider putting in suprapubic because of this. Can you take urinary catheters out when you use an epidural? Yes, this is from my friends at McGill who have shown that they actually have a decreased UTI rate and no increase in urinary tension or need for reinsertion of the Foley relative to epidural if it's done in a protocolized way. Central venous lines, I think the anesthesiologist in the audience would agree that for most colorectal resections, these are not necessary. They don't need them for monitoring anymore, and they also um, don't want to increase the risk relative to the need for uh, infusion during the surgery. They occasionally will be used for our patients, either if the patient has difficult access or they're particularly frail, or during a difficult pelvic resection where it's specifically a redo pelvic resection, or if we know it'll be a long time, perhaps including intraoperative radiation. All of these catheters are recommended to be removed within the first 24 hours of placement. A couple of reasons. One, um, placement is difficult to be done sterilely. These are these are um, catheters that tend to go through the skin and have a high infection rate if they're left longer than that. So in summary, trying to get us caught up here, uh, NGs, don't use them routinely. Pelvic resection the same. The evidence level is high. Recommendation grade is strong. For drains, intra-abdominal drains, don't use them. Again, um, evidence level for that is high. For drains in the pelvis, this is really somewhat anecdotal and what you're worried about from the time of surgery. Um, routine drainages discourage the indications for possible drainage are there. And urinary catheters, try to get them out as soon as you can with the indications for keeping them, as I've mentioned. Consider prolonged drainage if you have the um, a thoracic epidural, prolonged being one day. And in the rectum, uh, it'll be somewhat determined by the procedure that's been done, the patient factors, and what the surgeon feels needs to happen with postoperative pain management. Overall, these are the references, again, that I mentioned, and these are available to you. Uh, again, pretty obvious, a little bit older data back to 2009, 2010, um, because most of this was all decided before we um, developed our enhanced recovery protocols. And, uh, <coughs> use less.